Welcome to Fight City NYC. My name is Ben Chan. My comrade in arms, Aris Pena, is at the dentist's office today. Aris, I hope the next time we see you, you have all your teeth and not a boxer smile. Best of luck to you. We've got a full set of boxing to talk about. Let's recap first what happened this past weekend. We had two major fights on Showtime and on HBO. We're going to start with the HBO card. James Kirkland versus Alfredo Angulo. The fight ended in a, in a technical knockout in the sixth round. What a fight. What a first round, which saw both fighters hit the canvas. The first courtesy of Alfredo Angulo's right hand, which knocked down James Kirkland. And for all intents and purposes, a lot of people thought that the fight was over because that was a really, really hard, strong right hand that caught Angulo. And we've seen in the past, in uh, previous fights, how Kirkland's had some chin issues. But after the fight with Ishida, he hooked up with uh, again with his former trainer, Ann Wolf. And all credit to Ann Wolf. This time, James Kirkland was able to weather the storm. And not only did he weather the storm, he came back in the round. Later in the first round, he knocked down Alfredo Angulo in a storm of punches. This, uh, this James Kirkland is not the same James Kirkland that fought um, Ishida earlier this year that got TKO'd in the first round. This is a totally different beast. And all credit to Ann Wolf who has worked on his conditioning and her methods are very unorthodox and aren't going to work for all fighters but this is a, this is a case where you have a perfect uh, the perfect combo of fighter and trainer what she does for him makes him a different kind of fighter and i truly believe that she gives him that she uh, pushes him uh, and turns him into a different kind of monster and Credit to uh, Alfredo Angulo, who was working with uh, Nacho Berenstein for the first time that night. It seemed like he was. It seemed like the fight was over after the first round, but James Kirkland kind of led Alfredo Angulo back into the fight during the second round, and it seemed like he got his second wind. But my God, James Kirkland beat the crap, beat the second wind out of Alfredo Angulo, and by the sixth round, he was throwing arm punches and. And there was a storm of punches. The ref had no choice but to call the technical knockout. It was a good stoppage and it was a great win for James Kirkland. He is the man at 154. We're not, we're not sure what he's going to do. There's been talks of maybe him fighting Lara, the last guy who beat Paul Williams. Maybe, he, maybe he'll fight Paul Williams. But I don't think anybody at 154 pounds wants a piece of uh, James Kirkland right now because he is a beast. Um, there's been some talk maybe of him moving up in weight uh, to middleweight and fighting Sergio Martinez. I'm not sure that James Kirkland wants a piece of Sergio Martinez because uh, as crazy and as scary as James Kirkland looked in the ring that, that night, I think Martinez has the tools to beat Kirkland. I think it'd be a great fight and that's a fight I'd love to see, but I'm not sure that's the next fight he should have. I think both guys need a lot of rest, uh, especially Alfredo Angulo. I'm not sure if Alfredo Angulo can put, to, can put the pieces back together again because he took a beating that night. And credit to him for, for coming back. And it was the ref that eventually stopped the fight. Um, we'll see what happens with Angulo. James Kirkland has a bright future. The cards are, are, the ball is in his court right now in terms of what he wants to do. We'll see who wants to fight him at 154. Maybe he moves up to 160. But a great fight that night. There are some people who, uh, definitely the, the fight of the year in the first round. There are some people who are saying that maybe it's the fight of the year. I'm not sure about that. I think there have been some more compelling fights. But this one is definitely a contender. For those of you who, who didn't get to see it because it wasn't on a, a cable network, I would check out Luis Concepcion versus Hernan Marquez, uh, which is a fight that a lot of people are talking about. Later on this year, we'll have our fight of the year. We'll have our show where we'll do the wrap up and we'll talk about the fights of the year. Also on the HBO card, we had a friend of the show, Petey Quillen, fighting uh, Craig McEwen. This was his HBO de de debut, and he did a really good job. Um, Craig McEwen had previously been beaten by Andy Lee, and this was more of a one-sided beating by, by Petey Quillen. He showed he has the tools, and more important than uh, displaying his skill, he showed that he makes for good fights. He is a guy, he's not a perfect fighter, he has some vulnerabilities, but he's aggressive and he makes, and he makes good fights. So this is something that hopefully, that hope, this is hopefully the start of something uh, new with HBO. Hopefully this is um, the start of something new in the middleweight division where we have a, a good American middleweight who will be able to, to make good fights. The middleweight division is kind of barren right now, but there are guys out there and of course you have the man right now, Sergio Martinez. I'm not sure if Quillen is ready for Martinez. He certainly thinks he's ready for Martinez and kudos to him for having the courage to face Martinez. But there are some other European fighters out there, uh, maybe some of the Canadian fighters, maybe some of the English fighters, but I'd love to see Petey Quillen uh, move and fight those guys on HBO. 
he makes good fights and hopefully we'll see more of him. So congratulations to Quillen. And next, let's talk about the Showtime card where the main event was uh, Lucien Boutet versus Glenn Johnson. Um, it was a sparring match for all intents and purposes. Lucien Boutet does uh, what he always uh, does, uh, did what he always does. He boxed his way to a victory. He showed some power there, but it was really on Glenn Johnson to make the fight. We knew that in order to make a good fight, or in order to have a chance of winning, Glenn Johnson had to get in close, and he had to muscle and make, he had to muscle into Boutet and make him feel uncomfortable. Unfortunately, that didn't happen a lot in the fight. Uh, Johnson tried to be a counterpuncher. He tried to fight at a distance, and he was not gonna outbox Lucien Boutet. And so we had 12 rounds of spirited fighting uh, from both guys, but Johnson didn't fight the fight that would put him in the position to win, unfortunately. And so we had a unanimous decision in favor of Boutte, uh, sort of a lopsided decision. And Johnson, like he always does, complains about the victory, uh, about, about the victory for Boutte. He complained that the judges were shading the fight towards, towards him because he's the hometown fighter. It, it was fun Quebec. And look, there have been times when Glenn Johnson definitely got the short end of the stick. There are times when he didn't get the benefit of the doubt because he was fighting in another fighter's uh, hometown. This isn't one of those times. This was a this 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 was a fight where most of the rounds, uh, maybe all the rounds, should have been in Lucien Boutet's favor. You know, Johnson ended the fight on his feet. He's he's complaining. It, I'm, I'm not sure who, who Johnson wants to fight next. I'm not sure if there's much of a future in terms of boxing for Glenn Johnson. He still certainly has the tools. I'm not sure if, if he has the will to go out there and, and get in a guy's chest and, and, and give the other guy a beating. I mean, he's, he's like 42 years old now. So we'll see what Glenn Johnson does next. He certainly still has the tools to make good fights, and it's up to him whether he wants to, to go and, and keep on fighting those young guys in other people's countries. Lucien Boutet has a bright future ahead of him. We're all looking forward to him fighting the winner of the Super 6 tournament. The championship uh, fight is going to be in December. Uh, we have Andre Ward versus Carl Rock. So I would love to see Boutet versus either of those guys. Um, moving on, let's talk about what we have coming up this week. We, uh, this weekend, we have the, the big enchilada, we have the pay-per-view, we have Manny Pacquiao versus Juan Manuel Marquez. This is their third fight. This is the one that's supposed to settle it all, even though um, one guy has a victory, there's been a draw, and so maybe it might not settle, all, uh, settle everything if there's uh, a victory for Juan Manuel Marquez. Now, uh, in their first fight, Juan Manuel Marquez got, up, got off the canvas after being knocked down in the first, three times in the first round and fought his way back to a draw. Now, it should be noted that the reason it was a draw was because one of the judges didn't understand that he was, uh, that he was allowed to give a 10-6 score for a round. And so if the judge had known that, then maybe then the fight would have swung in pack. The decision would have swung in pack's uh, favor. But it was a, it would have been a very razor thin decision. And most people had a draw. Some people even had Juan Manuel Marquez winning. Some people had Pacquiao winning. You, I, 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 any of those results would have been fine um, and, and would have uh, would have been uh, justifiable. So it, based on the, based on the controversy, people wanted to see a rematch. Now, and uh, just a little bit about the history of what happened between them. Um, but, uh, the, a rematch was offered to Juan Manuel Marquez. He thought he was receiving the short money, so he decided not to do the rematch. And so he ended up toiling in obscurity for, for a number of years while Pacquiao was on the rise. Uh, Marquez actually ended up losing his belt uh, to Chris John in Indonesia for, I think, about $30,000. So we have one guy, Pacquiao, rising up and making a name for himself, while the other guy kind of fell back down to earth after the fight. Later on, years later, they were rematched, and again, it was a very, very close fight. The difference being the knockdown that Pacquiao scored, the one knockdown that Pacquiao scored in the fight. And again, it was a decision that could have gone either way. This time it went to Pacquiao, but it could have gone to, to Marquez, or it could have been a draw. These guys have fought 24 rounds altogether, and Marquez has won the majority of those rounds, but it's the knockdowns that have swung those fights, that have swung, swung the fights in Pacquiao's favor. Now they're going to be fighting at the welterweight level. There's been a catchway, but pretty, it's, it's, it's welterweight. And the question is how Juan Manuel Marquez will carry the extra weight. He's not good at, he, in, in the past, he's only fought once at this weight when he moved up to fight uh, Floyd Mayweather Jr. And he looked slow. 
he didn't look like he belonged in the same ring with with uh, Floyd Mayweather in terms of speed and, and skill. He looked like an old fighter. Now he's got a strength and conditioning uh, trainer and he's, he's moving up in weight, but he's building, doing it more responsibly. He looks good, but the question is whether he's gonna fight well, and we're not gonna know that until we see him in the ring. Now Pacquiao, we know what to expect from Pacquiao. He's a fast fighter, he's got the power, and you know, will he be able to knock out Marquez? I'm not sure if even at this way Pacquiao can outbox Marquez. Maybe the weight will affect Marquez's boxing, maybe it won't. Nacho Berenstein, uh, Juan Manuel Marquez's trainer, has brought up a good point that said, you know, in terms of the year, through the years, Pacquiao has gone from being a wild and predictable fighter to being more predictable and, and more of an orthodox fighter. He's still a left-hander, but he's a little bit more predictable. He doesn't throw punches uh, f uh, as wide as he used to. And maybe this time, maybe this makes it easier for Marquez to time him. That's a good point, and maybe this is just talk and trying to, to make his fighter feel good. I'm not sure, but that is, I think, a, legit, a valid, legitimate point, maybe. But the, the truth is, Pacquiao still has the power and still has the speed advantage over Marquez, and he wants the knockout. Pacquiao hasn't had a knockout in, in a good while, so this this time he maybe he wants to maybe he wants to finish Marquez and maybe he wants to prove once and for all that he is the better fighter of the two. We'll see what happens between them. I'm leaning towards Pacquiao in this in this fight. I won't be totally surprised if Marquez somehow somehow pulls it pulls it out of the hat. But I'd be uh, it's not something I'm, I'm counting on because um, but I've learned never to count out Juan Manuel Marquez. And I'm, I'm happy that he's getting a big payday. I'm happy that that um, that he's put his boxing career back together after losing the title to Chris Champ. Because he is actually one of one of the fighters that I very much respect in the sport. And of course, it's November. It's Pacquiao going to fight. So there's another guy who's not fighting, who has who wants the spot, a little bit of the spotlight. We had Floyd Mayweather coming out and announcing that he wants to fight Manny Pacquiao on May 5th. Now. It seems like they've been saying that they want to fight forever. It seems like the negotiations always get to a certain point and then break down. Um, all I know or all I've heard is that, look, the last time they negotiate, Pacquiao has agreed to the drug testing. He wants to fight. And it's Mayweather that seems hesitant on, on making the fight. So I'm not going to believe anything that anybody says until I see a signed contract. And I'm not even going to talk about Pacquiao versus Mayweather until the contract is signed. Until then, I have nothing to say about those, the, two, the two guys. There are other fighters in boxing, there are other fights in boxing, okay? Now also, fighting on the Pacquiao uh, Marquez card, we have uh, Timothy Bradley versus Joel Casamayor. Now, the last time we saw Joel Casamayor, or the last time I remember him fighting well, was when he lost the, the lightweight title to Juan Manuel Marquez. I'm not sure what to expect out of Joel Casamayor. Well, actually, I'm not sure what to expect, but I do expect to see an old, aging, slow fighter. Um, Timothy Bradley, he's the guy, uh, he's the junior welterweight uh, champion right now. Um, he beat Devin Alexander. Um, he's, he's a rugged fighter, and he's fighting a guy who's a veteran, who's a tricky fighter. Uh, he, he's sometimes, uh, well, not sometimes, he does use his head sometimes, he does use these borderline tactics. I'm not sure how much of this, that's gonna bother Timothy Bradley because in Timothy Bradley, I see a guy who actually does use some of the same tactics. So maybe it'll be an interesting fight. I'm not sure how exciting the fight will be. I'm not sure how much Joel Casemiro is gonna want to engage with Timothy Bradley, but I fully expect Bradley to win this fight uh, via decision, probably. Next up, we have uh, Brenda, Brenda uh, Prescott, uh, the guy who knocked out uh, Amir Khan versus Mike Alvarado. I think Prescott is a one-dimensional fighter. He, he has some skill, but he doesn't have world-class talent. I think the, the Amir Khan knockout was catching lightning in a, uh, in a bottle. Alvarado, he's a guy who looks good sometimes, who looks, uh, and if he presses and, may, and is aggressive, I think the fight might be interesting, but I'm not sure what to expect. I, I'm honestly not sure what to expect from, from this particular fight. So let's talk about the next fight, Luis Cruz versus Juan Carlos Burgos. This actually might be the most competitive fight on the card. It's between two young guys, uh, Luis Cruz, he's 26, and uh, Burgos is 23. 
one guy is from Puerto Rico, one guy is from Mexico, so you know there's going to be a lot of uh, national tension in there. And those, those seem, that seems always to make a good fight. Burgos is actually the veteran, even though he's, he gives up three years to Cruz. And he's, he's lost before, but uh, to uh, Hasegawa, the, the uh, long-reigning champion in Japan. And that's certainly not a bad guy to lose to. So uh, I give the experience to Burgos, even though he's the younger guy. And I'm looking forward to a spirited fight between two young fighters. I'm leaning towards Burgos in this fight. Uh, we'll see what happens. And this fight, will, the Cruz-Burgos fight is at 130 pounds. So that's, how, that's uh, what we have in terms of the Pacquiao-Marquez uh, three fight. It's gonna be on HBO on Saturday. It's, I believe the pay-per-view card starts at nine o'clock. So tune in. Um, and we get to see Pacquiao, we get to see Marquez. Hopefully they give us a, a, good, a good classic fight and a bookend to this uh, trilogy, or maybe they set things up for a fourth fight. We'll see. Now, even though we have the pay-per-view card, even though we had a potential fight of the year card on, uh, this past Saturday, the biggest news for me in boxing is the passing of Joe Frazier. Now, I got into boxing as a kid because uh, from watching the commercials on television for the uh, Time Life series about uh, Muhammad Ali, the uh, Fault Like a Butterfly, Sting Like a Bee, The Life and Times of Muhammad Ali. And as a kid, I got, I got bullied a lot because I was one of the few uh, Chinese kids uh, in the school. I was actually one of two Chinese kids and the other kid uh, was skinnier and a faster runner than me. So I was a fat, slow kid and, and I got uh, beat up a lot. And so I got attracted to boxing because I see this commercial of this guy who's just got so much bravado and so much courage and says whatever he wants to say and that was Muhammad Ali. And as I got into Muhammad Ali, I learned about this guy, Joe Frazier, his arch nemesis. And when I was a kid, I was an Ali fan and I, and I thought, oh man, Joe Frazier, yeah, I, I, you know, I, and when I saw the first, when I saw the, the first fight, the fight of the century, the one that they had in Madison Square Garden in 1971, the first heavyweight bout between two unbeaten uh, champions, I was pulling for Ali. I was an Ali guy. When I saw, when I, when I watched the Thrill of Manila, I was pulling for Ali because he was the guy. He he was he was he he was the guy who had the gift of gab. But as I got older, um, as I got more mature, I became more of a Joe Frazier fan. Because I realized that the things that Ali said about Frazier were unfair. Um, him making fun of Frazier, calling him a gorilla, calling him ignorant, calling him uneducated, they were totally unfair. Joe Frazier was an Uncle Tom. He was just, he, he was a blue collar fighter who bought himself up from nothing, much like Ali did. They were, they were both born from, they both came from impoverished backgrounds. And, you know, whereas Ali had the stage, he had the gift of gab, he had everybody listening. He was good at manipulating people. He was good at putting propaganda out. He was good at playing that psychological game. Joe Frazier was just an honest, salt to the earth, Philadelphia fighter. He was tough as nails. Joe Frazier, he 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 was he wasn't he wasn't dumb. Maybe he wasn't maybe he didn't have the oratory skills that Muhammad Ali had, but he certainly had talent and he certainly had a lot of personality. You can find clips of him singing and you can find clips of him talking back to Ali. He was just a man, he was a man of few words. He wanted to do his talking in the ring and he let his fist do his talking just like he did when he knocked down Ali in the 14th round in, in Madison Square Garden in 1971. He let that left hook do all the talking. And beyond being a boxer, Joe Frazier was a nice guy. You see a lot of documentaries and you see a lot of books that kind of play up the bitterness that Joe Frazier had towards Ali. And I think that's overblown. If you talk to people who actually experienced Joe Frazier, if you talk to people who have actually met who actually met Joe Frazier, you'll find out that he was a very nice guy. And one thing that he always had was love and adoration for his fans. He whenever the, whenever a fan asked him for an autograph, he would he would take the time to talk to the fan and sign the autograph. I got the chance to meet him several years ago at a book signing at Barnes and Noble. And I remember the, the line was really long and I went up to him um, and he signed my book. And I said to him, hey, you're one of my favorite fighters. You're right up there um, with another guy that I really like, Aaron Pryor. And he stopped, he looked at me and you can see the glimmer in his eye when you said, did you say Aaron Pryor? And I said, yeah, Aaron Pryor. And he said, oh man, Aaron Pryor, he's a friend of mine. He's, he's a great fighter. 
And that's, that's one of the things that you should know about Joe Frazier. He was the nicest, most complimentary guy. And he had a lot of nice things to say about Muhammad Ali too. You know, at the end of his, uh, towards the end of his life in the last several years, there wasn't a lot of uh, bitterness. There was just Joe, the nice guy. And he's a guy that will, sorely, that will be sorely missed in boxing and in the world. He's, he was a legitimate champion. He was, you don't see a lot of guys who come from what he came from. Down south, uh, the descendant of sharecroppers, worked his way up to be the heavyweight champion of the world. He was a gold medalist in the Olympics. And he fought at a high level. He fought all. He fought. He fought at a time when there were some monsters at, at heavyweight. He fought Ali. He fought. He fought George Foreman. And he was just an honest fighter and an honest man. And he was a good man. And we're gonna miss him. Thanks for watching Fight City NYC. Rest in peace, Joe Fra Joe Frazier. Rest in peace, Heavy D. And we'll see you next week.